So they have come this morning to, as a show of support, but also just to be family with us. And I just want to say, as a leadership team, we really value that, and we want to say thanks. Some of you may know that I've been uh, spending quite a bit of time in Romans this last few months, been eager to get into it, eager to start speaking about it. And so this morning I am going to share a little bit from Romans chapter 1, specifically verses 16 and 17, and then launch on from there. I just will read it out to you first before we start. Paul, in addressing the church in Rome, establishing, as many people feel like these verses establish the purpose of his letter, and he says this, I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. And in verse 17, he says, For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Paul, such a passionate man, such a passionate lover of God, writing to the church in Rome, a church that he didn't start, he didn't establish it, but he is so eager to go there and preach and see the gospel transform lives. It's interesting as you, are, as you look at the history in Rome and the foundation of the church there. So much had been happening. In AD 49, Suetonius, the, the Roman historian, records that there were riots in Rome, specifically in the Jewish quarter. And in his historical records, he says that they were instigated by someone called Crestus. Crestus was a common slave name, but also, some scholars believe, could be a misspelling of Christus. You know who that is. And so some, some historians, some scholars believe that the riots may have been due to the introduction of Christianity into the Jewish community in Rome. And it may have started the riots. But as a result of the riots, Emperor Claudius banished all Jews from Rome. In a ruthless move, he, he just said, you must leave. Many left. Some people argue that the ones who remained uh, could have been the ones who were, who were Roman citizens. Did you know that uh, when Rome went out and conquered lands and brought back slaves, sometimes those slaves were brought back to Rome and later released. And a slave that was released was often made a Roman citizen. But we... we I want to connect back with Paul at this moment and just tell you in Acts 18, Paul is in Corinth and there he meets Aquila and Priscilla who are craftsmen like Paul and he met them in Corinth. And do you know why they were there? Acts tells us because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. In AD 54, the death of Claudius ends the expulsion edict and Jews return to Rome. And it's interesting that a little later in Romans 16.3, at the end of the book of Romans, Paul is sending out his greetings to everyone he knows. And he says, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in Jesus Christ. So they have returned to Rome. When Claudius died, his, his, uh, his rules, <laughs> the things that he implemented are rescinded upon the emperor's death and Jews are allowed back. 
But it's interesting, in, in Rome at this time, the church has been established. Did you know in Acts 2, on the day of Pentecost, it says that there were visitors from Rome there amongst those who were saved on that very day. So we can assume they went back to Rome and they established the church there. After Claudius' edict had been rescinded and the, and the Romans and the Jews have come back into Rome, it might have been a really difficult time because the church had been established, the Jews had been there, it had been predominantly a Jewish thing, <laughs> a Jewish expression. And then the Jews were kicked out, leaving predominantly a Gentile church. And I believe that this sets up the picture for, for Paul's writing the book of Romans. In the book of Romans, he spends so much time talking about the Jews and the others, the non-Jewish people and how they can get along and, and how God loves both groups equally. That's why he says a little earlier in verse 14 and 15, I'm obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I'm so eager to preach the gospel when you are in Rome. I get the feeling that Paul had heard, because he's friends with people in Rome already, that things weren't going well, that people were, it was difficult to work with these two ethnic groups, these two religious groups. And Paul wants to go there and sow into the community and show them how to live together in the promises of God. But he says in verse 16, as I read before, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it, the gospel, is the power of God to bring salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jews, then the Gentiles. I want to ask the question, why would Paul say that? I am not ashamed. Why would people be ashamed? Why would they be ashamed of the gospel? because they were under pr tremendous pressure. You know, the Romans didn't like anyone who was different. Tacitus, another Roman historian, said this, Christians hate the rest of mankind and view them as enemies. They belonged to a deadly superstition and have guilt that deserves the most exemplary punishment. That was the Roman opinion of the early Christian church. You know what that, all that language really means? They were different. We don't like different. We don't like what we can't understand. We're fearful of what seems strange and what seems different. If it doesn't make sense to us, we tend our human nature to lash out. And I believe that's what the Romans were doing, lashing out at something that seemed different. It wasn't status quo. The amazing thing is, that just a few years after Paul wrote the letter to the church in Rome, Rome had a new emperor, and his name was Nero. And all hell was getting ready to be unleashed on the church. And so Paul's letter is so prophetic, and so, so, <laughs> so needing to be listened to at this time, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power for salvation. Paul also talks in 1 Corinthians about how Christianity seems like foolishness. In 1 Corinthians 1.18, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So Paul was saying, no matter what happens, do not be ashamed of the gospel. No matter what people say, no matter what opposition you come to, no matter what pressure you feel, do not give in. Do not be ashamed because you're dealing with the power of God to bring salvation to all mankind. Because it is the power of God. That word power, dunamis, is used widely. It was used widely in Greek philosophy and religion. Paul, using a new, an, an Old Testament background for this word, brings in this idea of a God who possesses power and manifests, manifests that power in deliverance. 
Psalm 77, 14 to 15. You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the people. With your mighty arm, you redeemed the people. So here we have this idea of this power for salvation is a power for deliverance and a power for redemption. Amen? What a powerful picture dunamis is. Dunamis, the power of God to save. And as I said to you before, this big deal between the Jews and the other people groups, that power of salvation was given first to the Jews, then the Gentiles. And we know that in the middle of Romans, chapters 9, 10, and 11, Paul will talk a lot about God's promises to the Jewish people and his promises to all of us as well. So Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power for salvation for everyone who believes. And then in verse 17, he starts off with the word for. When you see the word for, you've got to ask, what's it for? Little trick there. For. What does the for mean? It means... It's his answer. He's about to answer his own question. How does salvation come to humanity? Verse 17, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. And if you've heard me speak before, you know that that word revealed, one of my favorite Greek words, apocalypto, the unveiling, the great unveiling, the eschatological unveiling is happening. This is Paul's eschatological language, end time language. The gospel, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is being revealed. So it's the present tense of the word, apocalypto, suggesting that Paul is thinking of an ongoing series of actions connected with the preaching of his gospel. So wherever the gospel is preached, the righteousness of God is unveiled in a progressive manner. It's happening all over the world every time. Every time the gospel is preached, there's an eschatological event happening. Isn't that amazing? I think it's amazing. There is an eschatological unveiling happening. It is the revealing of the righteousness of God. Paul got very excited eschatologically, and so should you be. Because we live in the beginning of the end. Paul's, if if you're trying to understand Paul, and you'll read this all the time with Gordon Fee, is that Paul had an eschatological mindset He was very aware that we live in the end times. And a lot of theologians will point to this idea of patience and anticipation in Paul. He anticipated the end times, yet he was patient for God to work. That's just really interesting to try and balance those two things. I digress. The righteousness of God. Dikeo sune theo. There you go. Dikeo sune is the common Greek meaning of that was justice. In what sense was God's justice or righteousness, how was that going to put people right with him? How was, you know, he said in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith. This is how salvation is going to happen. So what is this word for righteousness of God? What does this mean, these words? Uh, I have been through many books. I've read many Uh, commentaries and right now I'm going to try and give to you an incredible brief Reader's Digest form. I don't know why people say that because I don't know anyone who reads the Reader's Digest anymore. (laughs) No offense if you do. It's probably really good. I just don't read it myself. But in a brief form and in the minutes we have left, I just want to quickly bundle this up so that I can move on. (laughs) So in what sense this word... Diak, uh, this, this word, diakosune, this, this idea of righteousness, three distinct ways we can understand it and through church history, three different ways we've dealt with it. One, way, uh, method one is to understand it as an attribute of God, an attribute of his justice or his faithfulness, especially as he reacts, as he responds to covenant. Two is to do with a status given by God. A new, a new standing imparted to the sinner who believes. And this was, this was for, for Luther, this was his idea of good news, a new status. 
And one of, the, one of the commentaries said, in contrast to most medieval theologians, Luther viewed this righteousness as forensic. It's, it's about standing, it's about judicial status. The righteous status that is from God. And the third one is the activity of God. So we've had an attribute of God, a status given by God, and the third one, an activity of God. This, is, this one comes actually from the Old Testament, the Greek Old Testament, and includes a dynamic sense of establishing rightness. And this understanding, this interpretation, links into what I was talking about before, the dunamis power, which is a redeeming, delivering power. So the activity of God, and in the Psalms and, and in Isaiah, God's righteousness res, uh, refers to saving intervention on behalf of his people. Saving intervention, the righteousness of God that not only declares a new standing in him, a new alignment with God's righteousness, but a saving intervention on behalf of the people. You are made right with God. It's not just a passive thing, it's a reaching out of God to find the lost, to find the hurting, to find the one, to leave the 99 and find the one that's the, the saving righteousness of God. It's a manifestation of the saving action of God. So if we combine all three, are you still with me? It's all right, you're doing well. Combining all three of these, God's righteousness is about God being in a right place, his action in making you right before him as well, and the resultant status of those who are made right. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, he attacks this again and says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He made him who was no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might have right standing with God. So do you sense from that God's outreach into the world, desiring to bring sons and daughters into right fellowship with the Father. I want to read this same verse, verse 17 from the Passion Translation because it excites me. This gospel unveils a continual revelation of God's righteousness, apocalypto, a continual revelation. Every time the gospel's preached, there is more and more unveiling of God's future plans. The fact that God has a plan for humanity, an eternal plan. A perfect righteousness given to us when we believe. A perfect righteousness, perfect right standing given to us when we believe. And it moves us from receiving life through faith to the power of living by faith. So this righteousness that is attained through faith is maintained through faith. And through faith, we receive his righteousness and we receive his empowerment to do the very things we couldn't do when we were separated from him. So it's not a matter of earning his righteousness. It's a matter of receiving it. And in receiving it, being empowered by it to live the very life you are always called to live. So the Greek words, refers to the power of the gospel to impart to believers God's righteousness. The gospel is not just a story about where you need to be. It's about the power to get you there. This is now the justifying power that comes through faith and the righteousness for God coming to us who believe. And I love this that I read in another commentary. And see, I'm not boring you with the names of the commentaries or the authors, just grabbing highlights for me. That's my job. Go through all this stuff, grab the highlights and show them to you. <laughs> for Paul, righteousness of God is a relational concept, bringing together aspects of activity and status, the act by which God brings people, the act by which God brings people into right relationship with himself. No wonder Paul was excited about it. And he sits there penning this letter or speaking, dictating to the person who was penning the letter. Have I mentioned this before, that when Paul sent his letter, he would have sent it with someone who he trusted as a worthy carrier and reader of the letter? Someone who was equipped to read Paul's letter out to the people in Rome 
and to answer any questions. An emissary, an ambassador of sorts, who was equipped not just to deliver the scroll, but to read it to the people as if he were Paul himself and answer the questions that they may have. For Paul, righteousness of God is a relational concept, bringing people into right relationship with himself. Paul looks out over the church in Rome, sees the division, sees the confrontation, sees the persecution, sees people trying to make sense of this life in Christ and trying to make sense of the people to their left and to their right. A multitude of different ethnos, ethnic groups, people groups, different ideas, different backgrounds, people who were raised in the synagogue, people who had been hanging around the synagogue, people who had come from a pagan past. And Paul pens this letter and says, there is a righteousness available to all. And it's got nothing to do with your background. It's got nothing to do with your performance. It's got nothing to do with what you did. And it's all to do with what he wants to do for you. He wants to restore you to a place of right standing. And yes, there is the technical language there about uh, the sort of the, the language of the law court and the language of justification and, you know, of correct position and status. But here the father's heart here, he runs out, he reaches out to his sons and daughters and he says, I've made a place for you. Accept it by faith. Have trust in God. Express your faith and step in as sons and daughters. As I was reflecting on this yesterday, I was reminded, this is like my go-to verse, James, or verses, sorry, James chapter 1, 16 through 18. It's such an important verse for me. Do we have it on the screen? Some of you right now are going, sure is your favorite, Russell. You talk about it all the time. Don't be deceived. My dear brothers and sisters, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Isn't it interesting that James starts that section by saying, do not be deceived. What does that tell you? That this is a concept that you're open to being deceived about. This is a contested battleground. This is something the enemy will not give you rest about. He will try to unsettle you. He will try to shake your foundations. So brothers and sisters, do not be deceived. About what? That every good and perfect gift comes from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. He's always good, always reliable, always in love with you. He chose to give us birth. He offered righteousness to you. And as you accepted righteousness, sin was dealt with. Corruption was dealt with, and you came into what? Right standing with God? Correct. Something bigger, something more immeasurable than that. You came into family. You came into belonging. You came into purpose. You came into a place where the Father showers down over you his delight and his good gifts. He chose you. He chose to give birth through the word of truth that you can be a first fruit of all created. What does a first fruit mean? It's talking about the first harvest. So you imagine, get into your sort of agrarian mindset right now. Imagine that you have a crop and you've been watching it. You've been caring for it. You've been watering it. You've been getting rid of the weeds. You've been stressing about the, yeah, I'm just getting into a moment there with myself, the caterpillars that eat everything. <laughs> Someone help me, please. I've been into the veggie garden again lately. You know that. Oh my gosh. I mean, leave a little for me, please. 
they're thorough. I'll give them that. They do their work well. I digress. The first fruits were the first of the harvest and often collected and given to God as an offering of thanksgiving. Thanksgiving for what? For the great harvest that is to come, for this future wonderful abundance that is about to break forth for us. I get great pleasure of walking out to my veggie garden and going, there is abundance. We will eat tonight. We will feast on the harvest. I have had some nights like that. I'm not lying. I've had my moments where I've been, to give th- I've been able to give thanks for such a great harvest. And that the Father looks at you and goes, you're standing in me now. I've made you right. I've brought you back in and sons and daughters. I've released you from everything that held you back. I have birthed in you new life, declared you to be a new creature. And you are the first fruits of his eternal plan. The life you live now in the spirit, the life that flows out of you, the life that flows out of you when you touch other people, when you bless your brothers and sisters, when you pray for them, when you release life over them, is but a first fruit of what is to come. God's plan for the nations, for humanity, has begun. And you are his first fruit in that. And we, as his body, as his people, are his first fruit. His plan for eternity is being demonstrated right now. As Gordon Fee says, you are God's future prototype people. You are his prototype people. You are an advertisement of a prototype. You have been put out into the world as a demonstration of the first fruits of God's eternal plan. He saved you, he restored you, he brought you into righteousness as a first fruit for his eternal plan. And that's why I'm really getting into Romans. It excites the heck out of me. And I can so get in touch with Paul's passion to see sons and daughters come home, to see them come in to their right place, into family, into a place where